Okay, hello, can you hear me? Okay, good, good. Thank you very much. Hello, the Zoom people. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, sorry about the delay. Uh, and thanks to Sean for helping here. Now, let us do a small recap, all right, before we get into today's um, topic proper. So, um, we have a certain random variable x, and to any random variable, we can associate this object known as a cumulative distribution function, and in short, CDF, all right? So that is uh, given by this notation here. And in the, for continuous random variables, then the CDF here can be written as an integral from minus infinity to x of fx of u du. And if x is a discrete random variable with support um, on the integers, that means whole number, all right? on the integers, it takes values only whole number, then fx of k is nothing but the sum from i running from minus infinity, accumulating all the way from the left-hand side up to k of the probability mass function, dx of i. So this is the probability mass function of the discrete random variable, and this is the density, the probability density function of the same, of, of, I'm not the same, but the, uh, the continuous random variable, okay? So last time we saw some properties of this, uh, this particular function known as a cumulative distribution function. And here are some properties. Uh, number one, fx is non-decreasing. It cannot decrease because it's accumulating probability mass on the left to the right. And in particular, if you take x to the uh, as x goes to minus picked up goes towards zero. Number three, as x goes to plus infinity, this must go towards one. And number four, x right continuous. I think those are the essential properties. And uh, suppose x is a continuous random variable. Breaking up. Maybe this one. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Right, I think this is more stable using my Mac. All right, so we have that X is a continuous random variable, then how do we recover the density? Density is probability density function. So suppose I'm interested in the density at a particular point X zero, then this is nothing but you can differentiate the CDF, all right, and evaluate it at X equals to X zero for every X zero in R. Okay, all right, so that is for X continuous random variable. And if X is a discrete random variable taking on integer values, then you can recover the PMF at some value K by differencing. So FXK minus FXK minus one. Okay, so that is where we left off last time. And there's one topic, uh, there's one example that we have not yet done. Okay, so I want to do that, All right? And that is a relation between the geometric and the exponential uh, distributions, okay? Now, uh, can the people in Zoom hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So um, now recall, this is an example to make things a bit more concrete, all right? 
we have x being a discrete random variable on integer values, discrete random variable. And in particular, x is geometric p. Now, when I write this x geometric p like this, what I really mean is that the probability mass function looks as follows. All right, it is basically p, 1 minus p to the power k minus 1. k running from 1, 2, 3, all the way. All right, so that means that we fail a number of times before we succeed. All right, so this is the number of coin tosses we need in order to get the first hit. All right, so we need to fail k minus one times before we actually succeed. So that is the geometric random variable. Okay, now this, of course, as I mentioned, every random variable is a CDF, and the CDF is, of course, given by the following, right? F of x, maybe I evaluate at n, all right, is a sum over all possible values of k. Maybe I'll do i here. This doesn't really matter, up to n, of px of i, okay? So that is nothing but I can put in the uh, probability mass function, i minus 1. And there is this formula known as the geometric formula, right? Geometric formula, no problem, okay? So this says, uh, okay, a 1 minus r to the power n plus 1. Uh, to the power, right, this goes from one, I'm sorry. Otherwise things don't work, this is n. This n divided by one minus one minus p. Okay, so that is the geometric formula. Either you know it or you don't, but never mind. All right, so that gives rise to one minus one minus p raised to the n. Here, n takes on the values just like k, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So how does this look like? All right, so how does, let's graph it because I like to visualize things, all right? So it has values, it takes on values on the integers and in particular on the positive integers. So how does this look like? All right, so this is n and this is uh, zero, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Now, this is my geometric random variable, f, g, o, n, okay? Now, how does this look like? Well, on the left-hand side, it's exactly equal to zero, okay? Exactly equal to zero. Then we jump, all right? How much do we jump? We jump a big, a, a lot. Say p is equal to half, then we jump by half, okay? We jump by half. Right, this is supposed to be empty. All right, then there we go here. This is full. And then we jump by a quarter. And then we go here. And then this is full. You jump by a third. And so on and so forth. So what I'm graphing is actually this. What I'm graphing. And we actually get towards one. This is this value here is one minus one minus p, which is p. And so on and so forth. This value here is one minus one minus p squared. And eventually we tend towards one. So that is our CDF of this particular discrete random variable. Okay, so it is, as you can see, non, it is, um, sorry, I made a mistake here. It is right continuous. So this has to be solid. This has to be empty. This has to be empty. This has to be solid, empty, solid, empty, and solid, so on. Okay, so this is always non decreasing. And in particular, it's flat here. And basically, it increases at the integer values, all right? Now, so there is one particular example for, of a common random variable. You can easily find its uh, CDF, okay? Now, on the other hand, suppose x is now an exponential random variable, exponential random variable with some parameter lambda. Now, if you have an exponential random variable with parameter lambda, then its expectation is one over lambda. But never mind, that's not our issue at this point in time. Okay, so let's try to find the uh, cumulative distribution function. So what is the PDF first? The PDF looks like this. fx of x is equal to lambda e to the minus lambda x for x bigger than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. So that's the standard formula. Okay, now here else basically means x less than zero. Okay, so the CDF of an exponential random variable 
is equal to zero if x is less than zero because we don't have any accumulation. This is the PDF here. The PDF looks like this. So this is fx of x for an exponential random variable. And it basically decreases like this. Okay. And this point is lambda, right? This curve here has formula lambda e to the minus lambda x. Okay. So now if you accumulate all the mass on the left-hand side, you see that you're not picking up anything. Now, once you go onto the right-hand side, then you're picking up some mass. And how much mass are you picking up? Well, you can actually compute that. So for x bigger than zero, we have f of the exponential random variable evaluated x is going from zero to x of lambda e to the minus lambda u du. Okay, so I changed the, the inner, the argument of the integration. Okay, so at this point here, you can you should know how to integrate this and you get one minus e to the minus lambda x for x greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so now let's sketch the uh, cumulative distribution function. You can please verify this calculation. Right? I'm not going to do this. So this is the cumulative distribution function, f exponential x. All right, on the left-hand side, we have exactly equal to zero. Okay, and of course we go towards one here. And so we go in this direction like that. Okay, so this, this uh, formula is the formula of this part. Okay, understood? All right, so basically we increase in, uh, in this sort of fashion. So that is the cumulative distribution function of an exponential. In this part here, we are strictly increasing. Here, we are not increasing, but we are not decreasing. So the whole thing is non-decreasing. Okay, so as you can see, right, look at these two graphs here that are beautifully drawn. Okay, so what happens here is, actually I drew this wrongly. Can I, can I draw this again? We only jump up at one. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm also confused. Okay, so let me draw this a little bit better. We jump up at one. So whenever we are at zero, we don't do anything. We only increment at one. All right, so at one, we go up to this point here. This is empty here, fix zero, and we go up lower, fix, go up in this way, and so on and so forth, until we converge towards one, okay? So as you can see here, what's happening here, all right? So here we are actually going up as well, but here we are going up in a much smoother manner. You know, we're going up in a much smoother manner. So actually what is happening here and what the discussion in the book is trying to say that I won't say in too much uh, detail is that the geometric distribution here is a discrete approximation to the exponential distribution. So in particular, if you take these sort of small little steps, right, instead of going con in continuous time, you take all these small little steps, then you actually recover the geometric distribution. Can you see? So what I've drawn here is basically what is here, but superimposed onto here with a correct scaling. And I will not write down the scaling because there are too many formulas. So when we study this in, uh, I mean, I don't know when you study this sort of things um, before, you may have studied the geometric and the exponential random variables separately, but actually they are very, very much related, okay? And the relation is very intimate, all right? But uh, we don't have too much time to talk about it. If you're interested, right? I teach a whole class on this on Friday evenings, okay? So the, the uh, what is this? The geometric random variable and exponential random variable, we can actually make them, make the relation very precise and this leads to the some leads to the whole topic known as Poisson process that I'm I also teach. Okay, so anyway, uh, these two are related. I just wanted to show you the the forms of the cumulative distribution functions, and the rest of the discussion you can read in the book. I, I don't want to belabor the point because there are too many formulas there. Okay, so we have actually completed our discussion of. Um, of cumulative distribution function. And I want to go to today's topic, topic proper. So today we're going to cover two things, all right? We want to cover very, the most important random variable on this planet, okay? Gaussian random variables. And that is section 3.3. .3. And if we have time, we'll talk about um, joint PMFs, or joint PDFs, okay? Uh, and that is section 3.4. Gaussian random variables are the most important thing. All right, 
because everything can be approximated by Gaussians. Okay. So if you have difficulty doing computations on some problems, Gaussians usually come to the rescue. So Gaussian is like bell curve, right? So we're going to make precise what we mean by this bell curve type of random variable. So we say that a random variable, a continuous random variable X is normal or Gaussian. Normal and Gaussian mean the same thing. If it's a PDF takes the form, takes the form F X of X equals to one over square root two pi sigma squared e to the minus x minus mu squared over two sigma squared x in r. Now this is this looks very complicated, but it's actually not because I do this every day. <laughs> I have already memorized some things. But a Gaussian random variable is such that it is parameterized by this exponential function here. But this argument here, this thing in the exponential is a quadratic. That's how we remember. It's a quadratic in X. Unlike this exponential random variable, it also has an E something. But this is linear in X. All right. So the point here is that this is quadratic in X. Drops very fast. Okay. Here, mu and sigma are two parameters of the Gaussian. So in particular, if you look at this exponential random variable, it has one parameter, which is lambda. Okay. So if you change the lambda, you have a new random variable. Right? The lambda actually governs the rate of this falling. Okay. So the point here I want to make is that the Gaussian has two parameters, and this uh, mu can be anything, any real number. Can be any real number. Sigma, however, must be positive number. All right, you cannot have sigma be zero, it cannot be negative. Okay, so now how does this look like? Now in the PDF, the PDF looks like this, all right? So here, it looks this, like this bell shape. Mu is here and sigma is some positive number. So here is our fx of x, right? And it looks like this. So let's see whether I can draw a beautiful Gaussian or not. Right, so this goes like this all the way up here. Usually, the student's grades can be modeled by a bell curve. So this is very important. So my bell curve is very beautiful and symmetric, right? Look at my beautiful iPad drawing. So the width here is governed by sigma. The larger the sigma, the bigger the spread. Okay? But yeah, we cannot actually visualize sigma here. Sigma basically measures the spread of this particular PDF. Okay, so if sigma is bigger, the spread is bigger. So you can also graph the CDF here. The okay, CDF. All right, so we have the CDF drawing like this fx of x. Okay, so this is our mu here, the same mu. And what's happening here? Let me draw, draw this. Okay, at mu itself, you will pass by half. All right, because if you okay, let's. Is that true or not? Um, yeah, okay. So if you look at a CDF, you're basically integrating from the left-hand side, okay? Remember that the CDF, Fx of x, you take the integrate integral from the left-hand side of Fx of u du for a continuous random variable. So what's happening here is that you are going from the left-hand side and you're increasing, right? You're integrating from the left-hand side up to this point, and you're going to, okay, and here you're converging towards one, one. Just nice. That's the CDF of a Gaussian. Okay, and the speed at which it increases is governed by sigma. If sigma is very small, if sigma is very small, you go this like this, very fast. Okay. Right. So there's a Gaussian CDF, and and we, as with any PDF probability density function, what are the properties that we have to check? Okay. Look at this person here. Look at this guy here. What are the two things we need to check? for this to be a valid PDF. If I tell you that this is a PDF, will you trust me? Did I make any mistake? Sometimes people will forget this square here and so on and so forth, but uh, what is the first thing we need to check? It is non, a PDF it is, okay, let me call Elvin Chi. A PDF is non something.
Can Elvin Chi hear me? No. Let me call Muhammad. A PDF must be non something. Uh, can, the, can the people in Zoom still hear me? Non discreet. Uh, not quite. Not quite, but non negative. Exactly. Very good. Perfect. It is non negative. So let's check whether this is non negative. Now, this is a constant. It is a positive constant. We are good. This guy here, it is what? Is the exponential. Exponential of anything is positive. So these two things are positive. You multiply two positive numbers, you get a positive number. So this whole thing is non-negative. Good. Elvin G, good. Now, one more thing. The PDF must satisfy what? It must... Let me call random people. Sonia. I know Sonia. Uh, the, P the PDF has another property. What is the property? Let me, let me partially write down. The in what this, if you integrate the PDF, what do you get? What is this number? Okay, someone help Sonia. Yes, thank you. So this is not so obvious actually. Like for, if, we, if we do this, all right, it's actually a difficult exercise in integration. Actually not difficult, uh, um, but it is a tedious exercise in integration to verify that this is actually one. You need to do polar coordinates. I don't know whether you, you know or not, polar coordinates. It's an exercise in a book that I didn't assign. So this is indeed one, okay? You need to change this to polar coordinates and do trigonometric integration in order to get this. So the Gaussian PDF satisfies non-negativity and it integrates to one, but the integration to one is a bit difficult that we will not require, okay? Now, everyone okay? So these are the two properties you need to internalize and completely remember. So good, Sonia also knows, very good. So the mean and variance of this very important, this is the most important distribution ever. The mean and variance of a Gaussian with parameters of a Gaussian uh, given by this PDF of a Gaussian given by this PDF fx x equals to this is expectation value of x equals to mu and the variance of x is equal to sigma squared. We are going to show these two things. Okay, so why is the expectation equals to mu, right? If you look at the PDF, what do I always say? That you can actually eyeball the expectation. You don't have to do very complicated integration. Now, the expectation is where if you put a, a wedge, right? Then the whole PDF is balanced there, if I draw it properly. So if I put the wedge here, the left mass and the right mass are the same. So it, the whole thing gets balanced. The PDF, the expectation is actually the center of gravity. So if I just eyeball this, the expectation must be mu. There is no other way, no other number that is reasonable. Understand? Elvin G, understand? So I, I don't really have to do this. But if you want to do carry, if you want to carry out complicated integration, you can. Okay, except that I won't do it. What I will do is the variance. Let me compute the variance. Okay, so just a remark. The fact that expectation value of X is equal to mu is easy to see after some time since Fx is symmetric around mu. So there's no other choice. Okay, so the variance, however, is a little bit more involved. And the steps that I go through now are going to be a bit difficult for you. So don't worry if you don't uh, internalize everything, you have to go home to try to internalize it, all right? Now the variance of X can be computed in the following way, integral of X minus mu squared of this particular density, all right, X dx. So that is the definition of variance, okay? Remember that variance of X is equal to expectation value of X minus the mean quantity squared, okay? 
And so that's what exactly I'm doing. Now, at this point here, the, the natural thing to do is to define Z to be X minus mu over sigma. Okay, so that is the change of variables formula. This remains. And we have Z squared one over square root two pi sigma squared e to the, now you have to remember to dz equals to dx over mu sigma. So this is minus, um, how many? z squared over two, dx is sigma dz. Now, I do not know how you learned this, but that's how I learned it, <laughs> right? So um, let's see. So I did this a little bit wrongly, x minus mu is sigma squared here. Okay, two callous, All right? So this cancels with this. So now what we have is uh, sigma squared on the outside, all right? And we have the integral minus infinity to infinity of z squared one over square root two pi e to the minus z squared over two dz. Now we have to do integration by parts. I may be going too fast, but these are mechanical steps. These are not probability, so I will go a bit fast. All right, I don't really expect you to carry out this integration, okay? Because that's not the point of this class not a probability class, okay? Uh, it's not an integration, not a calculus class. <laughs> yeah, because I'm too excited, all right? So we have to do integration by parts. How to do integration by parts? Uh, we are, oh, this is very difficult integration of parts. Yesterday I did it, I don't know, right? So we're gonna split this z squared into z times z, okay? And we're gonna bring out the two pi because it's very painful here. So what we are going to do is we are going to integrate this part here and we are going to differentiate this. This is the way we're going to do it. Okay, right, so minus z, okay, you have this e to the minus z squared over two with infinity, infinity minus, you put down the integral here and you differentiate. Okay, that's it. That's my integration by parts. So this one goes to zero. And now we are left with this. Uh, there is a missing minus here, okay? Now, then you are left with sigma squared over, all right, let's see sigma squared here. You're left with sigma squared and integral from minus infinity to infinity, one over square root two pi, e to the minus z squared over two dz. But this is equal to one because this is the PDF of a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one because this is the integral of a PDF of a zero mean unit variance. Unit variance means variance one, Gaussian. And hence we have shown that the variance of X is equal to sigma squared. Okay, after a little bit of integration gymnastics, okay. If you want to do integration gymnastics, we can work together. I, I really like this sort of things. Okay. So the point is that if you have a Gaussian PDF that looks like this, then its mean must be sigma. Sorry, the mean is mu and the variance is sigma squared. The standard deviation is sigma. All right. So um, the mean of the, the mean and variance of a Gaussian are this and this respectively. This and this respectively. And the standard deviation of X is equal to Sigma. It's basically the square root variance. Okay. Now Gaussians are very beautiful. They are the most beautiful thing since sliced bread. Okay. Gaussian is named after the great mathematician Gauss. Okay. So this is named after him. You know what Gauss is famous for? Let me tell you a story. Yes, that is what, he, but do people know what's 5,050? Right, so Gauss, when he was very young, he was asked by his teacher how to add up the numbers one, two, all the way up to 100. Can you add this up very quickly? That means you are a little bit not as good as Gauss. Slightly worse only. Because if you were Gauss, right, what would you do? You will pair these two up. And then you will pair these two up. Two and 99. You will pair these two up. And you see that there are sums are 101. The sum here is 101. How many pairs do you have? 
50. Because you have 100 numbers here and you're pairing, pairing. You're, everyone has, every man has a wife, right? So how many couples are there? There are only 50 couples. And so every sum is 101, 201 times 50. How much? Uh, it's 5,050. This is what David is trying to say. So this is the sum of these 100 numbers. No formula needed. Also, Gauss is famous for this. But Gauss is also famous for this particular density, the Gaussian. All right? And many other things. Too many for me to talk about. Okay? But here is one very beautiful fact about Gaussians. Okay? So normality is preserved. Or Gaussianity or Gaussianity. That means the, the state of being Gaussian is preserved uh, by linear transform. Okay. So the, what, is, what are we trying to say here? Let X be a Gaussian random variable with two parameters, with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, okay? Now we create a new random variable y, which is ax plus b. Then the fact says that y is also Gaussian. y is also Gaussian. And furthermore, the mean of y is equal to a mu plus b, and the variance of y is equal to a squared variance of x which is a squared sigma squared. Now, you may wonder, right? It's such an innocuous statement, right? It's very obvious, but there are many, most random variables do not satisfy this, all right? Suppose we have a Poisson random variable, all right? Immediately, it does not satisfy this, all right? But why? Because uh, Poisson random variable x, now, if I tell you that x is a Poisson random variable, and I ask you to write down the PMF, what is the first thing that you should do? Think of where its support is. The Poisson random variable is supported on the non-negative integers. Right? The Poisson random variable, you need to know that, okay? Because uh, this is a standard, standard PMF, Poisson. Now, if I multiply the Poisson by five, so five X, the A here is five, then, it's no longer a Poisson random variable because it does not take values on the non-negative integers, take values out of 0, 5, 10, and so on and so forth. So the support is already wrong, right? The support is already wrong. So Poisson is not close under linear transformation. That's what it's meant. That's, that's how we say it in mathematics. But the Gaussians are close under linear transformations. Most distributions are not close under linear transformations. Most, like exponential also, sorry. Okay. So Gaussians are very beautiful. They have this property. Okay. Now, anyone has any questions at this point? Yes. Okay. Let me... Okay. Let, let me say that... Uh, more carefully, CF refer to, okay, let's say Z is a Poisson random variable with rate lambda, okay, then PZ of K is E to the minus lambda, lambda K over K factorial, where K takes on values 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth, okay. So now I create a new random variable that's called W, it's equal to say, I don't know, minus I don't want to do five, but let's say minus three Z. Okay, minus three Z. It's a linear transformation. Then the support is all wrong already because now W is supported on the set zero, minus three, minus six, minus nine, and so on and so forth. And this is not the set of non-negative integers. So the support is already wrong. So there's no hope that W is a Poisson random variable. Okay, now if you take W equals to 5Z, like what I talked about just now, also wrong. All right, it is not going to be a Poisson random variable because the support set, right, is missing a few things. 
is missing the value is is missing the probability mass at one two three four missing so it cannot it's still not a possible random variable possible random variable must be positive on all non-negative integers okay that's a mouthful yeah so if i do a linear transfer so the conclusion is that if i do a linear transformation on a Poisson, I don't get a Poisson. Okay, so Poisson is not close under linear transformation. That's what is, that is the way people in math say it, uh, but never mind. So only Gaussian, right? So Gaussians are very particularly beautiful. Okay, let me press ahead. Are there any more questions? Okay, the, the Zoom people also don't have any questions, right? So I don't know whether everyone is lost or not, but let's uh, press ahead. So let's consider this special class of random variables known as standard normal random variables. Standard normal, okay? So we say that, uh, so if Y is a Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance one, then we say that Y is a standard Gaussian random variable. Okay, so these random variables are very beautiful, standard Gaussian random variables. They are particularly beautiful because um, everything is standardized. It is right in the middle and its variance is not too large, not too small. Okay, so, because Gaussians are so important, right? People actually tabulate the CDF, all right? So I'm going to talk about tabulation later on. And this is very, it's a very old fashioned thing, but we have to learn it. So it's CDF, that means the CDF of a standard Gaussian is given a special symbol. Given by this phi, this Greek, this is uh, called phi in uh, Greek. I think it's Greek. I cannot draw it properly. And it's a latex symbol is PHI. Maybe this is going to be the next variant. <laughs> this is the um, symbol for the CDF of a Gaussian. So this is phi of Y is equal to probability of Y less than Y. This is the problem. This is the CDF of a standard Gaussian. So basically you integrate from minus infinity to Y of one over square root two pi. Since the sigma is one, E to the minus U squared over two DU. That is the CDF of a Gaussian. Okay, so that's good, right? That's very good. So what is the point of this? All right, because a lot of people want to evaluate the CDF of a particular Gaussian. And in old times, in old times, and maybe even like 15 years ago, it was a bit difficult to get our hands on MATLAB or Python. So what do people use? I don't know. Huh? Yes, people use not log tables, but Gaussian tables. So what do people use back in the good old days? When I was studying, I still use this sort of things. All right. We use this. Um, so this is the table of, this is the, basically the table of um, the CDF of a Gaussian, all right? How do we read this? Do you know how to read this? Suppose we want to use, suppose we want to find, suppose we want to find phi of, um, what do we want? 0 0.55, how do we read this? I learned this many, many years ago. You go to the 0 0.5 here, and then you go to the 0 0.05 here and you read this number. So this is equal to 0 0.7088. I don't know whether you learned this before. Okay? You never learned this before. This is not in JC. I, I learned this in JC many years ago. Okay? Suppose we are interested in, okay, you're interested in phi of uh, 0, maybe phi of 3.5. Zero, 
Okay, so very simple. You go to the three here, 3.00 here. Ah, so that's your fee of 3.0. Okay, so maybe not so big, all right? Maybe we like a fee of uh, 1.68, okay? Then we go to 1.6 here and we go to, we go to 0 0.08 here. 0.08 here, and then we go here. As you can see, this is a very old fashioned way of doing things. <laughs> Nowadays, we don't do this anymore, but it's good for you to know this. All right, so this is how we get to the cumulative distribution function because the integration of the PDF does not have a closed form expression. So this is the only way that we do it in the good old days. In the exam, now you still do this, okay? If I ask you to evaluate the CDF of something, I will give you this table and you go and figure it out. Okay. So um, that is the table. Okay. But you notice that the table only has positive values. Why does it only have positive values? All right. Why does it only have positive values? The reason is the following. Okay. It's not quite a CDF because the CDF could be very asymmetric. All right. So the table is tabulated, is tabulated uh, for y bigger than or equal to zero, as you can see. How about y less than or equal to zero? We don't have that. So suppose if we want to find phi of minus 0 0.3, for example, maybe 0 0.34. Okay, what do we do? Do we give up? No, we don't give up. Because phi of say minus 0 0.34 is the probability of a standard Gaussian less than minus 0 0.34. But the Gaussian is symmetric about zero. The standard Gaussian is symmetric about zero. So this is the same as the probability of y bigger than or equal to 0 0.34. All right, because you notice that here, that is the PDF of a Gaussian, right? Standard Gaussian is symmetric around zero. And this is minus 0 0.34. And so you're accumulating the probability mass here. Sorry, my, my ink is a bit fat. All right. And then here, this is 0 0.34. And the area that I highlighted in blue is the same as the area that I'm highlighting here in orange. Okay? So these two are the same. Okay, so now we are not done yet, right? Because this now we can rewrite this as one minus probability of 0 0.y less than 0 0.34. Okay, so basically this area here in orange is one minus, is one minus the area in red here. Is one minus the area in red here. Okay, so the two, the red area and the orange area add up to one. And so, okay, now we can invoke this fee. This is exactly fee of 0 0.34. And we're good. Because now you can go to the table and you can do one minus. Okay, you can go to the table, you can look up this guy here and you take one minus of it. All right, so there's nothing special about the number 0 0.34. So indeed, yeah, we can find phi of minus y is equal to one minus phi of y. This is always true. And this holds for all y in R. Okay, so this part you can find from the table. And so the table gives us values for all values of uh, y being on the real line. Okay, everyone understood? Okay, this is actually very old fashioned stuff, right? But we have to learn it. We have to learn Gaussian, right? We have to learn Gaussian somewhere, somehow. So now I want to talk about standardization of a Gaussian. We can, we have Gaussians that may not be standard, may not be standardized. So it may not have mean zero, variance one, but we like to standardize Gaussians because then we can refer to the table. Okay, standardization of Gaussian random of an arbitrary Gaussian random variable, all right? 
say we have X Gaussian, usually you write this as normal mu sigma, mu sigma squared. This means that the PDF of X is one over square root two pi sigma squared e to the minus x minus mu squared over two sigma squared. Okay, so that is the meaning of this. Usually people write this to be fast. Okay, so we can consider the new random variable y, which is x minus mu over sigma. Now, because Gaussians are close under linear operations, y is also Gaussian. But what is the expectation value of y? Well, the expectation value of y is nothing but you can do this, okay? Expectation is linear. And you have one over sigma mu minus mu, which is zero. Using this standardization, we remove the mean and we divide by the variance, okay? So the variance of y is equal to one over sigma squared, all right? variance of x minus mu. Because if we multiply this quantity here, all right, then we have to multiply the variance by the square of it. Okay, that's the rule. So this is one over sigma squared. The variance of x minus mu is the same as variance of x. And so the this is one over sigma squared times sigma squared, which is equal to one. So this operation here, the operation, from x to y via this formula normalizes or standardizes, or maybe standardizes is better, standardizes, standardizes y to a standard Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so it standardizes, that's nice. What's the point of standardization? The point of standardization is that you can use the table, all right? So um, for example, we can do the following calculation, okay? But before I do the following calculation, does anyone have any questions? So this is a linear operation, a linearity preserves Gaussianity. That means if I do a linear operation on a Gaussian random variable, I still remain Gaussian. I just have to figure out the mean and the variance and the mean and the variance can be figured out using the standard rules of expectation and variance. Okay, everyone good? Let, me, let us sit down and do an example, okay? Now, the annual snowfall, my gosh, this is, a, some people tell me uh, that this book is too Americanized, like uh, Dong. Huh? He, he or she, I don't know whether he or she, tells me that the book is Americanized. And indeed, this, this example is very Americanized because where, where is the snow here? But never mind, let's assume that there's snow. The annual snowfall in Boston, where this book was written, the annual snowfall X has mean mu equals to 60 in just, gosh, American as well. And standard deviation, and standard deviation, sigma equals to 20. Okay, so this is the annual snowfall statistics that we have collected over many, many years. And it is at 60 and it has a certain uh, variance. So that is Fx of x. That is the snowfall. Yeah, that's about right. When I was living there, it was like this, okay? But uh, why is this um, not a good model? Can anyone tell me why this is not a good model? So the book says the annual snowfall in this particular city has mean mu 60 and standard deviation 20. Why is this not a particularly good model, but uh, it's reasonable, okay? So the, the spread here is about 20. Yes, snowfall cannot be negative. You cannot have snow getting up. You can only have snow falling down, right? But here there is some mass over here right, that is not accounted for. So this book is not very good, all right? So, but never mind. let's just accept it, all right? So this year, we had a particularly heavy snowfall, all right? So what is the probability that the snowfall this year or this day, whatever, so far is more than 100 inches? 
Oh, this is in inches. Okay, I don't know whether we use inches here or not, but whatever. Okay, so the problem, so we are interested in the probability that x is bigger than one hundred. Okay, but x is not standardized, so there's a problem. Whenever we encounter non-standardized random variables, Gaussian random variables, it's a good idea to standardize it. So basically, we take away the mean, x minus the mean, and we divide by the standard deviation, which is twenty. So of course, we have to do the same on the right hand side. 100 minus 60 over 20. Cool. Can you follow? I just take away the mean and um, divide by the standard deviation. I take away the mean. Maybe I call it mu. And this. So this is a standardization operation. Okay. So now on the left hand side, we have a certain random variable, y, which is standardized. So y here is a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one. Beautiful. Bigger than uh, two, right? So, well, what is y bigger than two? Because the table is tabulated. The table is tabulated, right? If you want to use it for phi of y, which is probability that y is less than equal to y. So we are trouble. We are in trouble because we don't have y less than equal to y. We we, what we want is y bigger than two. Then what do we do? So we have. We have a table of values for phi, which is probably y less than equal to y. But we want y bigger than two. How? What is a way to massage this? Uh, what is differencing? Um, yes, one minus. So one minus probability y less than equal to two. That's one way. Right? Why? Because let me draw a picture. Now we have a Gaussian that is centered at zero, it's standardized. It's standardized, so it's here. Now my Gaussians are getting worse and worse, but never mind. This is the density of Y, which is standardized. So the variance is one, and we are at, very, we are at mu equals to zero. And we're interested in the probability that Y is bigger than two. So here's two for example, and we are interested in this particular area here, okay, this area. But as you can tell, this area is one minus the area over on this side here. Okay, so this is this part here, and this is uh, this part here, okay? Understand? So now we can use our table, right? What does our table say? I, I don't know, but you can read off the table as, as good as me. One minus phi two. And phi two is, I know, one minus zero points. I, I used to memorize the table actually when I was young. Nine, seven, seven, two. So this becomes zero point zero two two eight. Nowadays, we don't memorize table anymore. But yeah, so that's the way we do it, okay? Uh, so this is an example of normalization. You have a random variable that has some mean and some variance that is not one. Then you have to take away the mean, you divide by the standard deviation and you get a standard normal random variable and then you can refer to the table. Okay, that's the procedure. Now, okay, so I will go through the next example after a break. Now we take a 12 minute break and we come back at 3.10, okay? And when we come back, please, tell, please remind me to start the record. Okay, great. Uh, is everyone back? I guess everyone is back. The other tutor actually told me that um, uh, uh, to told, told me that um, you should show up for the tutorial. I also think that you should show up for the tutorial. So try to do so because it's actually useful. Even though we record the Zoom for the other tutorial, okay, it is you, it's good to show up because then you can um, ask questions directly. And uh, many of the tutorial problems and homework problems will be recycled for the assessments. All right, it's not surprisingly. So you should try to internalize everything that I go through in the tutorial, everything that the other guy goes through in the tutorial, okay? So now, in case people say we are very abstract, let me discuss with you <clears throat> a real-life communication uh, system. All right, this is called BPSK. You can go and do Wikipedia or what is BPSK. Binary phase shift keying, okay? So we have a certain binary message that's encoded to minus one plus one binary message.
h that's encoded to plus minus one. All right, so there's one plus minus one we're gonna send through the channel. So it's either plus one or minus one. And in the channel, what happens here is that we are gonna add a certain random variable n that is distributed as a Gaussian with zero mean and variance sigma squared. Okay, and what we receive is y. What we receive at the, at the uh, output of the channel is y. So that is the input and that is the output. We send a one or a minus one. So someone tell us whether there is a war or no war, but the message gets corrupted by random Gaussian noise. And what we hear about whether there's war or no war encoded as plus minus one is y. Okay. So a very, a very natural thing to do is the following. If y is bigger than or equal to zero, we decode to plus one. All right. If y is less than zero, we decode to minus one. So why do we do this? The picture is as follows. Okay. So what's happening here is that we have now got two Gaussians, one here, one centered at one and another centered at minus one. Because if we send plus one, okay, if we send plus one, if the message is plus one, then y is, has mean one and variance sigma squared. y has mean one and it, uh, its variance is sigma squared. And in a complete analogous fashion, if the message is minus one, then y has mean minus one and the same variance. So this is the picture that we have in our heads. Okay, so we have this. So this is if we send, if x, what we send is plus one then this is what we receive over in our output, okay? And if we send minus one, then this is what we see. This is the, the, the probability density function of what we observe, y. Okay, so if we send minus one, this is what we observe, x equals to minus one. That is our density of y. So the way you write it is f of y given x, y given x, okay? And this is the density of y, the probability density of y when x is equal to plus one. This is the density of y when x is equal to minus one. Okay, so you see that there's some, it makes sense for us to decode to plus one if what we receive is positive. And it makes sense for us to decode to minus one if what we receive is negative, understand? Okay, uh, another info piece of information we need is that this is um, equally, it is equally probable for the sender, equally probable for the sender to send plus one or minus one. These are equal probable symbols, okay? Right, so let us think for a little bit when we make an error, okay? Now, if we send x equals to minus one, when do we make an error? Right, if we send x equals to minus one, we make an error if y is bigger than zero. Right, we, because if y is bigger than zero, we decode to x equals to one, which means that we have made an error. Is everyone follow me? So suppose I sent the message x equals to minus one, and I receive, because of, the, because of the inherent noise in the system, I receive y such that y is positive. Then I will decode to x equals to one, and this is an error, right? This is an error relative to this. You agree? Okay, those people are nodding. Those people that are with me. Very good. So the point here I want to make is that the probability of us making an error conditioned on the fact that we sent minus one is the same as the probability that the noise is bigger than one. Okay? 
Why is that so? The noise is what you add on to X. If X is at minus one, you need to add on noise that is bigger in magnitude by one than one in order to get a Y that is bigger than zero. So these are equivalent, right? You make an error, condition of the fact that you send a minus one, you make an error if Y is positive. But when is Y positive? It is when the noise is too positive. The noise is bigger than one. Are you with me? All right, so you, you were here initially. The noise must kick you to here, must kick you to the right-hand side. So that is what is written here. You were here initially, but the noise must kick you to this half plane here. Follow me? Okay, now we make use of what we learned before. We have to standardize things. The, no the, end, the noise random variable has zero mean. We don't need to subtract its mean. But the noise random variable may not have variance one because it has variance sigma squared. So what we have to do is to divide both sides by sigma. greater than one over sigma. This is the standardization, okay? But now the N over sigma is a bona fide standard Gaussian random variable, okay? So this is a standard Gaussian random variable, okay? So what we have here is one minus, this is exactly one minus phi of, one minus phi of one over sigma. This is the same principle as what we had just now. We have a standard random variable bigger than something, okay? But we cannot use a table. We cannot use a table. Unless we express everything in terms of cumulative, cumulative distribution function. So this is standard random variable bigger than something. But if the standard random variable is bigger than something, it is the same as one minus the standard random variable, uh, one minus the cumulative distribution function, less than, that, less than that something. Okay, we have seen this before. All right. So this is our standardized random variable, standard already, is centered at zero, and it has a variance one. Okay. And we are interested in what is the probability that it is bigger than one over sigma. So the probability here. Well, that is nothing but one minus the probability over on this side, the yellow part, right? And this part here, the yellow part, may yellow is not a good color, is phi of one over sigma. Understand? So suppose we sent my minus one, this is the probability of error, okay? We are going to show this soon. We're going to do a few more drawings soon. Now, of course, we can also send x equals to plus one. And by a calculation that's completely symmetric and I will not belabor the point, the probability of error condition on X equals to plus one is the same. Everything is symmetric. Okay. So the overall probability of error by the law of total probability is the probability that I send minus one probability of error given x equals to minus one, well, plus the same thing with plus one, okay? So this is nothing but half of one minus phi one over sigma plus half one minus phi one over sigma. So you get one minus phi one over sigma. Okay, so this looks very strange, okay? So actually this has a certain name. One over sigma is known in communications as the signal to noise ratio, S and R. Maybe you've heard of this before, since you are EE people. Signal to noise ratio or S and R. Have you heard of S and R? EE people will have heard of it. Math people won't, all right? So the signal has this power. One, because it's, it is a BPSK, it is a one minus one, it's encoded to one and minus, minus one. That's the power of the signal. And the power of the noise is sigma. All right, so this is a signal to noise ratio. And the larger the signal to noise ratio, okay, the larger the signal to noise ratio, the smaller the error probability. So we can actually write the probability of error 
as one minus one minus phi of the signal to noise ratio. And we can plot this. We can give this a plot. Okay, this is the signal to noise ratio. Usually the signal to noise ratio is expressed in terms of dB. You know it's dB, decibel, but never mind. All right, so you can plot the probability of error as a function of signal to noise ratio. And it looks like this. If the signal to noise ratio is very, very low, I say very bad, okay, then you have probability of error one here. Then it goes down to half here. That's signal, signal to noise ratio is zero. And then it goes like this. Yeah. So this has a name, this is called a Q function, but I don't want to inundate you with too many words already. So the larger the signal to noise ratio, the smaller the probability of error in communications. Does this make sense? All right. So for example, if your signal to noise ratio is one here, all right, then this point here is one minus phi one, which turns out to be 0 0.1587. Okay, but usually we operate with a pretty high signal to noise ratio here. Okay, uh, we don't like a probability of error of 16%. Understand? You understand this example? David, not very abstract, right? <laughs> oh, no, no. The person who said it was abstract is not David, it's a Sean. Not very abstract, right? We, we send one out of two symbols, and they get corrupted by noise. We want to see how much noise will actually push us into the forbidden zone. And the amount of noise that pushes us into the forbidden zone is n bigger than one. Then we have to normalize this as what we have learned. Okay, and then we can write it in terms of the phi function, the cumulative distribution function of a Gaussian, standard Gaussian. And then we are good to go because uh, we know that the priors the, the probability of uh, sending a one or a minus one is half half. And then we can merge everything together to get this. And this is identified as a signal to noise ratio. Okay. And then uh, we can do this plot here if you want. Okay. Is this very clear? David, any questions? Okay. Mm. So you don't have to worry so much about the conditional probability density functions at this point. I've not gone there. What I just want to say in this picture here is that if the input is one, then how does the output look like? It looks like this. It's centered at one now. Because the input is one, the noise has zero mean. And so the output will have mean one. All right, the output will have mean one. And the standard deviation stays the same. If you don't understand this, it's okay. We will talk about it in uh, one week's time. Okay, so the, the, if I send one, then the output looks like this. If I send minus one, the output looks like that. And because of, and when do I make a mistake? If I send minus one, I make a mistake precisely when I land in the right half plane. And I'm accumulating this area here. I'm trying to integrate this area. This is where I make a mistake. All right, this place, is the probability of error when I send minus one. And similarly, this spot is the accumulation of all the probabilities that I make a mistake if I do send x equals to plus one. And this should be symmetric, except that my drawing is not very good. Make sense? Are those people there? Okay. Right. So in this half plane here, that is what I'm trying to say. In this half space here, I declare that x is equal to one. And over on this side here, it's very natural for us to declare that uh, x is equal to minus one. That's what we declare, All right? Maybe I will use English. Okay, is it clear? Yeah, this is uh, practical, right? Very practical, this is BPSK. If you go on to do communications in future modules, then you will learn about um, PAM, PAM, and then QAM, quadrature something. Uh, I, I don't do this sort of things. 
quadrature amplitude modulation, I think. Okay. Now, any questions? So, so you see now everyone knows that Sonia overslept. So she didn't come to my tutorial. All right. So this is the topic on Gaussians. It's super important. There will be one exam question on this. I need everyone to know what is a Gaussian and how to manipulate Gaussians. And I'll give you the table. So you need to know how to read it, okay? <laughs> I think I've heard this five times today. <laughs> Any questions on this uh, Gaussians? All right, so let's talk about another topic in the, re in the short remaining time that we have. I don't think I can finish talking about this, but it's fine. We don't need to rush. Okay, so I want to talk about drawing PDFs of um, multiple random variables. Now, if you have taken any sort of statistics or probability class before, you will come across one random variable. But at this level, we need to talk about two random variables, right? Then if you take my graduate class, we will talk about infinitely many random variables. Right? And then I'm also teaching that on a Friday. We talk about many random variables, okay? So we say that uh, two random variables are jointly continuous. Uh, jointly continuous if um, they can be described uh, in terms of a non-negative function f x y okay such that the probability that x and y belong to a set B. B is a subset of the plane. This can be given by the integral, the, the what is this, double integral of x, fx, y, xy, dx, dy. All right, so this is the multi-dimensional generalization of what we have seen before. But this is a bit abstract. I have to agree with you, that is abstract, okay? For example, if B is the set, all the set of x, y, in the plane such that x is between a and b and y is between c and d so what is this set here okay so this is basically a rectangle so we have a b c and d so this is the set this is our set b all right because x is between a and b and y is between C and D, right? So that is our set of interest, okay? So we are interested in the probability that X and Y land in this set, okay? So the probability that X and Y land in the set B is given by the integral from C to D, integral from A to B of F, X, Y, X, Y, DX, DY. So basically you're integrating over this rectangular region. Okay. Uh, in the first year, you all learn double integral, right? Here. Okay. So you are comfortable with double integration. I never actually learned double integration in my life, but you can infer what's happening from here, right? You, you integrate this way and then you integrate that way. Okay. Double integral. All right. I think it must be in some MA1 class. So, so what we have is the following, right? If B is the whole space, that's the plane. R squared is basically the plane, the whole plane. Then the probability that X and Y belong to B, that is the integral from minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity of this. Uh, this is called a joint PDF, right? This is called a joint PDF. PDF. Okay. Right. So uh, this is basically a multi-dimensional generalization of um, the PDF we have seen for the one-dimensional case. Okay. So now suppose, right, so we need to get all these definitions out of the way before we do some examples. Suppose we are interested in this in the event. 
X belonging to A. All right, this is some event. And we don't care about Y. Don't care about all about Y. So that's nothing but the probability that X belongs to A. But you can rewrite that as probability that X, Y belong to A and minus infinity to infinity. So Y basically goes from minus infinity to infinity. X belongs to A. Okay. So you can rewrite that in the following simple way. Integral over A minus infinity to infinity of the following. But here you integrate over Y first, then X. All right, because the X goes with the A, the X goes with the A and the Y are integrating out. Okay. Now, if we compare this to the, to the case when X is just a single random variable, then this is nothing but integral over A, Fx of X dx. That is for a single random variable, we have a single PDF. So what we see here from these two expressions is that this part here, right? Of course, the left-hand sides are the same. That's why we set it up in this way. This part here is exactly this part here. All right. And so what we have is the following. We can do marginalization. The marginalization operation gives fx of x is equal to, now I take away y by integrating it out, dy. So that is a very important formula that allows you to recover the PDF of x from the joint PDF. So that we call this the, if you wish, the marginal PDF. And this is the joint PDF. Okay. Why do we need to integrate y first? You don't have to. You don't have to. Very good question. That means you are with me. So you can rewrite this as you integrate this way first and you integrate over a f x y x y d x d y. You can do this if you want. Except that what I want to do, right? I, and I, I skip one step, is that I want to relate it to this. So I need I need the a the integral over a to be on the outside in order for me to compare these two. Then these two cannot be compared because because the x the dx is not outside. All right, here the dy is on the furthest outside. Right. So this I, I skip one step. I, I I cheated a little. Right. But this is a very good observation why I do it this way. That's because this is not convenient for us. Right. Not overly convenient. Right. So we don't do we don't do it. So in a similar, in a complete analogous way, this is the marginalization to get x. We can marginalize to get y as well. F y y is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f x y x y dx. Okay. So there's the marginalization to get the marginal PDFs both ways. So this may be quite difficult to visualize and very abstract, as you will say, if we don't provide. Uh, copious amount of examples. So here, let's consider a very simple example of a two-dimensional PDF. Okay. So let me try my very best to draw a beautiful two-dimensional picture, three-dimensional picture. I can draw two-dimensional very well. Okay. So here is my, um, maybe let's not make this so long. Okay. So let me, like this. Okay, so this is my x, and this is y, and here we go up to a, here we go up to b. All right, so now my two-dimensional PDF is the following, okay? You have to visualize it in a three-dimensional plane, okay? This is a zero point, this way here. Okay, so that's the base, and now the PDF, that we have is actually going to be a box here. What is this? It's actually called cuboid, if you wish. Okay. So the, the PDF is actually the height of this. Okay. So 
Now what I'm going to draw is f of x, y, x, y. And this part here, this surface here is actually f of x, y, x, y. The surface here. Okay. So mathematically what's happening is the following. So here I'm going to shade this part here. And I'm going to write down a particular formula for this. So we have f of x, y, x, y is equal to a constant C because this is flat surface, right? It's a constant C when x is between 0 and A and y is between 0 and B. Else. Understand? So this height here is how much is C, but we have not figured out what C is at this point in time. Do you like my picture? So fxy is actually the height of this thing. All right, we want to figure out how high it should be. What is the height of this cuboid, right? The base is this rectangle with sides AB. So what is the height, okay? So let's see. We have to satisfy the normalization equation. So for the joint PDF to satisfy the normalization equation. And the normalization equation is the following. One is equal to minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, fxy, xy, dx, dy must be equal to one. This is the normalization equation, okay? So we don't have to integrate from minus infinity to infinity for the x part because the only action that happens is from zero to a. Okay, so this becomes integral from zero to a and an integral from zero to b of this thing here, right? Because outside the region, the density is zero. Okay, everyone following? Okay, I don't know how great you are in integration, but uh, we have to do a little bit of it. So this is nothing but integral over a to, sorry, integral over zero to a, zero to b, c at dx dy, because the height here is c, right? The height here is c, All right? So now if you perform this integration, you get a, b, c here, which means that c is equal to one over a, b. Okay, okay. So we choose C here. The book uses A and B equals to one, okay? But never mind. I'm more general. We choose C here to be exactly one over AB. Why is that so? Because we want, instead of the area under the graph to be one, we want the volume under the surface to be one. And by choosing the height C to be one over AB, the volume of this cuboid is exactly equal to one. Because base times height times the base, this base times the base times the height is one. Can you see that? The drawing is beautiful, right? Okay. We will do one last example. Right, so this is the visualization of the PDF. It's a two-dimensional surface. Unlike the case of one-dimensional, you have this curve and you find the area under the curve. Here you are trying to find the volume under this particular surface and the surface is the surface of this density this part this surface here this is the surface okay got it good so more generally okay let, let me just write down one comment here the volume of the region uh, under the surface is one okay so more generally, more generally, if we have a subset S, okay, this is a general statement. So then F X Y, X Y, and X Y is uniform. It doesn't have to be uniform, but let's say it is uniform on the set S, then F X Y is given by one divided by the area of S, if XY belongs to S, 
and zero otherwise. Okay, so that is a general formula for a uniform random variable. Okay, but uniform, you need to specify, just like in the one dimensional case, you need to specify which interval it is uniform on. All right, a random variable that is uniform on zero, one is different from a random variable that is uniform on one, 10. Okay, so here we are uniform on this particular interesting region, which is this, this rectangle, AB. But we can be uniform on some other region as well. And this motivates the next example. Okay, let us consider the following more complicated example. So we have that the joint PDF of X, Y is constant or uniform, it's a constant C on the set as, as specified below. Okay, so here we have the picture and I'm only gonna draw a 2D picture now because this is impossible to draw in 3D unless you are an artist and I'm not an artist. Okay, one, two, three, four. So we have this set here. This is the Y axis, this is the X axis. All right, so we have this set here, this. So we have this strange set, but nevertheless, it is still a set. Okay, and this is our set S. Okay, I'll set S is basically this strange shape here. So I have a few questions for you. One, find the value of C and B. All right, so this is a FXY here, XY. I'm not gonna draw 3D, I'm only gonna draw 2D. All right, find C, FXY equals to C when XY belongs to the set S and zero otherwise, find C and number two, find the marginal PDFs. Fx and Fy. Okay, this is a bit non-trivial. Right, so we are uniform on this set here. Just to make it clear. Okay, we are uniform here. Okay, so now I want you to find C. So you must think in 3D, right? So this is a bit the base. And the height is the height above the yellow region, all right? I cannot draw 3D for this, but I drew 3D for this, all right? So that is the base, is the yellow region. And you must think that this region is on the, on the floor, and then there is some protrusion from the floor, okay? That, that gives you this surface here. So there's this, there's this surface here, and then there's a protrusion from the floor that only comes out of this particular surface, which is the yellow surface. Understand? Can you visualize this in 3D? Okay, so can you tell me what's the value of C? Mm. Let me see who wants to volunteer. One over? One over four, yes. A. The answer C is one over four. Why? Because the area of S is exactly, you know, four. Four units. And so I've already specified the formula for the uniform distribution on S, and you need the constant here to be one over the area, which is one over four. Okay. So Fxy, Xy equals to one over area of S, which is one over four, when X, Y belongs to S, zero otherwise. Okay, so now we do something more complicated. Any, anyone has any questions? Anyone? Now we're gonna do something more complicated, as if it's not complicated enough. <laughs> so let's do part B. When I learned this actually, I tell you, when I learned this sort of stuff, I was actually very confused. This is not easy, okay? 
So let's try to find the marginal PDF fx. Okay. Now, when I ask you to find the marginal PMF or the PMF of something, what is the first thing that you'll do? You find the Yes, you find a range. Some people say range. I like to say support because I'm an information theorist, actually. Okay. Um, so you find a support. Similarly, if I ask you to find the marginal PMF of f of x, you find a support. Where is, where is x supported on? It's only supported on this set here. Right? If, if x is bigger or smaller, there's no mass. So the marginal PMF of x, first we notice that uh, uh, the support of x is the closed interval one three. Okay, it's a closed interval one three. Now, how do we then evaluate the marginal p df? Let, let me just uh, copy this picture here, so I don't have to move up and down. Okay, let me put this picture here. Okay, so let's see. The support of x is one three. But there are two distinct regions here, right? One to two and one to three. So now let's say, okay, first and foremost, if X is less than one, the marginal PDF is zero because there's no mass over here. There's no mass at all. All right, so the only interesting things happen when X is between one and two. Then by the formula, you are integrating out the joint the y, but where does your y go from? Now, suppose your x is somewhere here, all right? Now, this is the x that I, I care about. It goes from one to two here. Suppose I'm at some point here, x. Then your y, the y that you're integrating goes from one to three, right? So when you do this integration, it is going from one to three. You know, this is not so easy because you have to figure out the limits here. One to three. Thank you very much because I'm very blur. All right, one to four. Thank you very much. But just now we figured out, or Liao Xue told me this is one quarter. Right? So this becomes three over four in this region. Okay? Now, there's one more region of interest, which is X between two to three. This is slightly different. Okay. Then our density is, again, we use the formula. But now our range of integration is different. Now our x is here. For this, our x is here, somewhere here. Then where are we integrating? Okay, where is the y of interest? It's from here to there. So here, the limits are two to three. Understand? But... We know what is the constant inside, which is two to three. The constant is one quarter dy. So this becomes one over four. Understand? Now, clearly, if x is bigger than three, there's nothing to be had or so. So this is zero. So combining everything together, combining all the cases together, we have the following marginal PDF of x. All right. Um, so we have one, two, maybe this moves a bit. Two three, four, okay? But the only action happens in one to three, okay? Between one and two, the value of the density is three quarter, okay? So here's the three quarter here. And between two to three, the value of density is one quarter. So that is your marginal density of X. And this value here is three quarter. This value here is one quarter. Okay. And let me ask someone, what is the sanity check I should do right now? In case I made some mistake as the I would. The area is equal to one. Very good. You know. So is the area equal to one here? Yes. Because this part here has area three quarter. And this part here is area one quarter. So you see, Oliver, you learned something from me. These two add up become one. Right? So I didn't make any mistake. 
Just now, if I did the integration wrongly, I would have made some mistake here. It would have propagated here. Okay, so this is very ugly. Let me just get rid of it so that the nodes become look nicer. So I figured out the marginal PDF of X. All right, and fortunately, sanity check. The integral of fxx from minus infinity to infinity dx is one, as it should be. Okay. I think all of us are very tired already. So this is where I will call it a day. I still have not done the marginal PDF of y. So we'll do it next time. Because I want to recap this whole exercise next time as well. Okay. But you need to understand the marginal PDF of x. Marginal PDF y, you can go ahead and figure it out. I will go through this one more time next time. I want to hammer home this point because surely there will be an exam question on this. Okay. Um, is everyone in the Zoom okay? This is where I will stop today. Today, we talk a lot about Gaussians and we talk a lot about joint PDFs. Okay. Um, is everyone in the Zoom okay? Do you have any questions? Sean? Are you okay? Javen? Oh, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much and have a... Wait, are we at the weekend? Yeah, we are almost at the weekend, but I still need to teach. Bye-bye. Take care. Any questions? Are we in front of